The Bracero program from the Spanish term bracero, meaning manual laborer, or one who works using his arms, was a series of laws and diplomatic agreements, initiated on August 4, 1942, when the United States signed the Mexican Farm Labor Agreement with Mexico. The agreement guaranteed decent living conditions, sanitation, adequate shelter and food, and a minimum wage of 30 cents an hour. It also allowed the importation of contract laborers from Guam as a temporary measure during the early phases of World War II. The agreement was extended with the Migrant Labor Agreement of 1951, enacted as an amendment to the Agricultural Act of 1949, Public Law 78 by Congress, which set the official parameters for the Bracero program until its termination in 1960. Topic Introduction. The Bracero program operated as a joint program under the State Department, the Department of Labor, and the Immigration and Naturalization Services (INS) in the Department of Justice. Under this pact, the laborers were promised decent living conditions in labor camps, such as adequate shelter, food and sanitation, as well as a minimum wage pay of 30 cents an hour. The agreement also stated that bracerists would not be subject to discrimination such as exclusion from white areas. This program was intended to fill the labor shortage in agriculture. The program lasted 22 years and offered employment contracts to 5 million bracerists in 24 U.S. states. Becoming the largest foreign worker program in U.S. history, from 1942 to 1947, only a relatively small number of bracerists were admitted, accounting for less than 10% of U.S. hired workers. Yet both U.S. and Mexican employers became heavily dependent on bracerists for willing workers. Bribery was a common way to get a contract during this time. Consequently, several years of short-term agreement led to an increase in undocumented immigration and a growing preference for operating outside of the parameters set by the program. Moreover, Truman's Commission on Migratory Labor in 1951 disclosed that the presence of Mexican workers depressed the income of American farmers, even as the U.S. Department of State urged a new Bracero program to counter the popularity of communism in Mexico. Furthermore, it was seen as a way for Mexico to be involved in the Allied Armed Forces. The first bracerists were admitted on September 27, 1942, for the sugar beet harvest season. From 1948 to 1964, the U.S. imported on average 200,000 bracerists per year. Topic: 1951 negotiations to termination. American growers longed for a system that would admit Mexican workers and guarantee them an opportunity to grow and harvest their crops, and place them on the American market. Thus, during negotiations in 1948 over a new Bracero program, Mexico sought to have the United States impose sanctions on American employers of undocumented workers. President Truman signed Public Law 78, which did not include employer sanctions, in July 1951. Soon after it was signed, United States negotiators met with Mexican officials to prepare a new bilateral agreement. This agreement made it so that the U.S. government were the guarantors of the contract, not U.S. employers. The bracerists could not be used as replacement workers for U.S. workers on strike, however, the bracerists were not allowed to go on strike or renegotiate wages. The agreement set forth that all negotiations would be between the two governments. A year later, Congress approved a bill that made the harboring of an illegal immigrant a felony. However, the Texas proviso stated that employing unauthorized workers would not constitute as harboring or concealing them. This also led to the establishment of the H-2A visa program, which enabled laborers to enter the U.S. for temporary work. There were a number of hearings about the United States-Mexico migration, which overheard complaints about Public Law 78 and how it did not adequately provide them with a reliable supply of workers. Simultaneously, unions complained that the Braceros presence was harmful to U.S. workers. The outcome of this meeting was that the United States ultimately got to decide how the workers would enter the country by way of reception centers set up in various Mexican states and at the United States border. At these reception centers, potential bracerists had to pass a series of examinations. 
The first step in this process required that the workers pass a local level selection before moving on to a regional migratory station where the laborers had to pass a number of physical examinations. Lastly, at the U.S. reception centers, workers were inspected by health departments, sprayed with DDT, and then were sent to contractors that were looking for workers. To address the overwhelming amount of undocumented migrants in the United States, the Immigration and Naturalization Service launched Operation Wetback in June 1950. 54, as a way to repatriate illegal laborers back to Mexico. The illegal workers who came over to the states at the initial start of the program were not the only ones affected by this operation. There were also massive groups of workers who felt the need to extend their stay in the U.S. well after their labor contracts were terminated. In the first year, over a million Mexicans were sent back to Mexico, 3.8 million were repatriated when the operation was finished. The criticisms of unions and churches made their way to the U.S. Department of Labor, as they lamented that the bracerists were negatively affecting the U.S. farmworkers in the 1950s. The Department of Labor acted upon these criticisms and began closing numerous bracero camps in 1957–1958. They also imposed new minimum wage standards and in 1959 they demanded that American workers recruited through the employment service be entitled to the same wages and benefits as the bracerists. The Department of Labor continued to try to get more pro-worker regulations passed, however the only one that was written into law was the one guaranteeing U.S. workers the same benefits as the bracerists which was signed in 1961 by President Kennedy as an extension of Public Law 78. After signing, Kennedy said, I am aware of the serious impact in Mexico if many thousands of workers employed in this country were summarily deprived of this much-needed employment. Thereupon, Bracero employment plummeted, going from 437,000 workers in 1959 to 186,000 in 1963. During a 1963 debate over extension, the House of Representatives rejected an extension of the program. However, the Senate approved an extension that required U.S. workers to receive the same non-wage benefits as Bracerus. The House responded with a final one-year extension of the program without the non-wage benefits, and the Bracero program saw its demise in 1964. The workers who participated in the Bracero program have generated significant local and international struggles challenging the U.S. government and Mexican government to identify and return 10% mandatory deductions taken from their pay, from 1942 to 1948, for savings accounts that they were legally guaranteed to receive upon their return to Mexico at the conclusion of their contracts. Many field working bracerists never received their savings, but most railroad working bracerists did. Lawsuits presented in federal courts in California, in the late 1990s and early 2000s decade, highlighted the substandard conditions and documented the ultimate destiny of the savings accounts deductions, but the suit was thrown out because the Mexican banks in question never operated in the United States. Today, it is stipulated that ex bracerists can receive up to $3,500 as compensation for the 10% only by supplying check stubs or contracts proving they were part of the program during 1942–1948. It is estimated that, with interest accumulated, $500 million is owed to ex bracerists who continue to fight to receive the money owed to them. Notable strikes January to February exact dates aren't noted 1943, in Burlington, Washington, bracerists strike because farmers were paying higher wages to Anglos than to the bracerists doing similar work 1943, in Medford, Oregon, one of the first notable strikes was by a group of bracerists that staged a work stoppage to protest their pay based on per box versus per hour. The growers agreed to pay them 75 cents an hour versus the 8 or 10 cents per box. May 1944, Bracerus in Preston, Idaho, struck over wages July and September 1944, Bracerus near Rupert and Wilder, Idaho, strike over wages October 1944, Bracerus in Sugar City and Lincoln, Idaho refused to harvest beets after earning higher wages picking potatoes. May–June 1945, Bracero asparagus cutters in Walla Walla, Washington, struck for 12 days complaining they grossed only between $4.16 and $8.33 in that time period. 
June 1945, Bracerus from Caldwell Boise Sugar Beet Farm struck when hourly wages were 20 cents less than the established rate set by the County Extension Service. They won a wage increase. June 1945, in Twin Falls, Idaho, 285 Bracerus went on strike against the Amalgamated Sugar Company for two days which resulted in them effectively receiving a 50-cent raise which put them 20 cents over the prevailing wage of the contracted labor. June 1945, three weeks later Bracerus at Emmett struck for higher wages. July 1945, in Idaho Falls, 170 Bracerus organized a sit-down strike that lasted nine days after 50 cherry pickers refused to work at the prevailing rate. October 1945, in Klamath Falls, Oregon, Bracerus and transient workers from California refused to pick potatoes due to insufficient wages. A majority of Oregon's Mexican labor camps were affected by labor unrest and stoppages in 1945. November 1946, in Wenatchee, Washington, 100 Bracerus refused to be shipped to Idaho to harvest beets and demand a train back to Mexico. The number of strikes in the Pacific Northwest is much longer than this list. Two strikes, in particular, should be highlighted for their character and scope the Japanese Mexican strike of 1943 in Dayton, Washington, and the June 1946 strike of 1,000 plus Bracerus that refused to harvest lettuce and peas in Idaho. Topic. Strike of 1943 The 1943 strike in Dayton, Washington, is unique in the unity it showed between Mexican Bracerus and Japanese American workers. The wartime labor shortage not only led to tens of thousands of Mexican Bracerus being used on Northwest farms, it also saw the U.S. government allow some 10,000 Japanese Americans, who were placed against their will in internment camps during World War II, to leave the camps in order to work on farms in the Northwest. The strike at Blue Mountain Cannery erupted in late July. After a white female came forward stating that she had been assaulted and described her assailant as looking Mexican. The prosecutors and sheriff's office imposed a mandatory restriction order on both the Mexican and Japanese camps. No investigation took place nor were any Japanese or Mexican workers asked their opinions on what happened. The Walla Walla Union Bulletin reported the restriction order read Males of Japanese and or Mexican extraction or parentage are restricted to that area of Main Street of Dayton, lying between Front Street and the easterly end of Main Street. The aforesaid males of Japanese and or Mexican extraction are expressly forbidden to enter at any time any portion of the residential district of said city under penalty of law. The workers' response came in the form of a strike against this perceived injustice. Some 170 Mexicans and 230 Japanese struck. After multiple meetings including some combination of government officials, cannery officials, the county sheriff, the mayor of Dayton and representatives of the workers, the restriction order was voided. Those in power actually showed little concern over the alleged assault. Their real concern was ensuring the workers got back into the fields. Threats of sending in army soldiers to force them back to work were made. Two days later the strike ended. Many of the Japanese and Mexican workers had threatened to return to their original homes, but most stayed there to help harvest an excellent pea crop. <laughs> Reasons for discontent amongst Bracerus First, like Bracerus in other parts of the U.S., those in the Northwest came to the U.S. looking for employment with the goal of improving their lives. Yet, the power dynamic all Bracerus encountered offered little space or control by them over their living environment or working conditions. As Gamboa points out, farmers controlled the pay and kept it very low, hours of work and even transportation to and from work. Transportation and living expenses from the place of origin to destination, and return, as well as expenses incurred in the fulfillment of any requirements of a migratory nature, should have been met by the employer. Most employment agreements contained language to the effect of 
Mexican workers will be furnished without cost to them with hygienic lodgings and the medical and sanitary services enjoyed without cost to them will be identical with those furnished to the other agricultural workers in regions where they may lend their services." These were the words of agreements that all Bracero employers had to come to but employers often showed that they couldn't stick with what they agreed on. Bracerus had no say on any committees, agencies or boards that existed ostensibly to help establish fair working conditions for them. The lack of quality food angered Bracerus all over the U.S. According to the War Food Administrator, "...securing able cooks who were Mexicans or who had had experience in Mexican cooking was a problem that was never completely solved." John Willard Carrigan, who was an authority on this subject after visiting multiple camps in California and Colorado in 1943 and 1944, commented, "...food preparation has not been adapted to the workers' habits sufficiently to eliminate vigorous criticisms." The men seem to agree on the following points, 1, the quantity of food is sufficient, 2, evening meals are plentiful, 3, breakfast often is served earlier than warranted, 4, bag lunches are universally disliked. In some camps, efforts have been made to vary the diet more in accord with Mexican taste. The cold sandwich lunch with a piece of fruit, however, persists almost everywhere as the principal cause of discontent. Not only was the pay extremely low, but Bracerus often weren't paid on a timely basis. A letter from Howard A. Preston describes payroll issues that many Bracerus faced. The difficulty lay chiefly in the customary method of computing earnings on a piecework basis after a job was completed. This meant that full payment was delayed for long after the end of regular pay periods. It was also charged that time actually worked was not entered on the daily time slips and that payment was sometimes less than 30 cents per hour. April 9, 1943, the Mexican Labor Agreement is sanctioned by Congress through Public Law 45 which led to the agreement of a guaranteed a minimum wage of 30 cents per hour and humane treatment for workers involved in the program. Topic. Reasons for Bracero strikes in the Northwest One key difference between the Northwest and Braceros in the Southwest or other parts of the United States involved the lack of Mexican government labor inspectors. According to Galatza, in 1943, ten Mexican labor inspectors were assigned to ensure contract compliance throughout the United States, most were assigned to the Southwest and two were responsible for the Northwestern area. The lack of inspectors made the policing of pay and working conditions in the Northwest extremely difficult. The farmers set up powerful collective bodies like the Associated Farmers Incorporated of Washington with a united goal of keeping pay down and any union agitators or communists out of the fields. The Associated Farmers used various types of law enforcement officials to keep order, including privatized law enforcement officers, the State Highway Patrol, and even the National Guard. Another difference is the proximity, or not, to the Mexican border. In the Southwest, employers could easily threaten Bracerus with deportation knowing the ease with which new Bracerus could replace them. However, in the Northwest due to the much farther distance and cost associated with travel made threats of deportation harder to follow through with. Bracerus in the Northwest could not easily skip out on their contracts due to the lack of a prominent Mexican-American community which would allow for them to blend in and not have to return to Mexico as so many of their counterparts in the Southwest chose to do and also the lack of proximity to the border. Knowing this difficulty, the Mexican consulate in Salt Lake City, and later the one in Portland, Oregon, encouraged workers to protest their conditions and advocated on their behalf much more than the Mexican consulates did for Bracerus in the Southwest. Combine all these reasons together and it created a climate where Bracerus in the Northwest felt they had no other choice, but to strike in order for their voices to be heard. Bracerus met the challenges of discrimination and exploitation by finding various ways in which they could resist and attempt to improve their living conditions and wages in the Pacific Northwest work camps. Over two dozen strikes were held in the first two years of the program. One common method used to increase their wages was by loading sacks", 
which consisted of bracerists loading their harvest bags with rock in order to make their harvest heavier and therefore be paid more for the sack. Also, bracerists learned that timing was everything. Strikes were more successful when combined with work stoppages, cold weather, and a pressing harvest period. The notable strikes throughout the Northwest proved that employers would rather negotiate with bracerists than to deport them. Employers had little time to waste as their crops needed to be harvested, and the difficulty and expense associated with the Bracero program forced them to negotiate with bracerists for fair wages and better living conditions. Bracerists were also discriminated and segregated in the labor camps. Some growers went to the extent of building three labor camps one for whites, one for blacks, and the one for Mexicans. The living conditions were horrible, unsanitary, and poor. One example of this is in 1943 Grants Pass, Oregon, 500 bracerists were food poisoned which was one of the most severe cases of food poisoning reported in the Northwest. This detrition of the quality and quantity of food persisted into 1945 until the Mexican government intervened. Lack of food, poor living conditions, discrimination, and exploitation led bracerists to become active in strikes and to successfully negotiate their terms. <laughs> Aftermath After the 1964 termination of the Bracero program, the A-Team, or Athletes in Temporary Employment as Agricultural Manpower, program of 1965 was meant to simultaneously deal with the resulting shortage of farmworkers and a shortage of summer jobs for teenagers. More than 18,000 17-year-old high school students were recruited to work on farms in Texas and California. Only 3,300 ever worked in the fields, and many of them quickly quit or staged strikes because of the poor working conditions, including oppressive heat and decrepit housing. The program was cancelled after the first summer. Significance and effects The Catholic Church in Mexico was opposed to the Bracero program, objecting to the separation of husbands and wives and the resulting disruption of family life, to the supposed exposure of migrants to vices such as prostitution, alcohol, and gambling in the United States, and to migrants' exposure to Protestant missionary activity while in America. Starting in 1953, Catholic priests were assigned to some Bracero communities, and the Catholic Church engaged in other efforts specifically targeted at Bracerists. Labor unions that tried to organize agricultural workers after World War II targeted the Bracero program as a key impediment to improving the wages of domestic farm workers. These unions included the National Farm Laborers Union NFLU, later called the National Agricultural Workers Union NAWU, headed by Ernesto Galatza, and the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee AWOC, AFL-CIO. During his tenure with the Community Service Organization, César Chávez received a grant from the AWOC to organize in Oxnard, California, which culminated in a protest of domestic U.S. agricultural workers of the U.S. Department of Labor's administration of the program. In January 1961, in an effort to publicize the effects of Bracero labor on labor standards, the AWOC led a strike of lettuce workers at 18 farms in the Imperial Valley, an agricultural region on the California-Mexico border and a major destination for Bracerus. The end of the Bracero program in 1964 was followed by the rise to prominence of the United Farm Workers and the subsequent transformation of American migrant labor under the leadership of Cesar Chavez and Gilbert Padilla. Dolores Huerta was also a leader and early organizer of the United Farm Workers. According to Manuel Garcia y Grigo, a political scientist and author of The Importation of Mexican Contract Laborers to the United States 1942-1964, the contract labor program, "...left an important legacy for the economies, migration patterns, and politics of the United States and Mexico." Grigo's article discusses the bargaining position of both countries, arguing that the Mexican government lost all real bargaining power after 1950. Recent scholarship illustrates that the program generated controversy in Mexico from the outset. Mexican employers and local officials feared labor shortages, especially in the states of west-central Mexico that traditionally sent the majority of migrants north Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacán, Zacatecas. 
The Catholic Church warned that emigration would break families apart and expose Bracerus to Protestant missionaries and to labor camps where drinking, gambling, and prostitution flourished. Others deplored the negative image that the Braceros departure produced for the Mexican nation. The political opposition even used the exodus of Braceros as evidence of the failure of government policies, especially the agrarian reform program implemented by the post-revolutionary government in the 1930s. On the other hand, historians like Michael Snodgrass and Deborah Cohen demonstrate why the program proved popular among so many migrants, for whom seasonal work in the U.S. offered great opportunities, despite the poor conditions they often faced in the fields and housing camps. They saved money, purchased new tools or used trucks, and returned home with new outlooks and with a greater sense of dignity. Social scientists doing field work in rural Mexico at the time observed these positive economic and cultural effects of Bracero migration. The Bracero program looked different from the perspective of the participants rather than from the perspective of its many critics in the U.S. and Mexico. A 2018 study published in the American Economic Review found that the Bracero program did not have any adverse impact on the labor market outcomes of American-born farm workers. In popular culture Woody Guthrie's poem, Deportee, Plain Wreck at Los Gatos, set to music by Martin Hoffman, commemorates the deaths of 28 Braceros being repatriated to Mexico in January 1948. The song has been recorded by dozens of folk artists. Protest singer Phil Ox's song, Bracero focuses on the exploitation of the Mexican workers in the program A minor character in the 1948 Mexican film Nosotros Los Pobres wants to become a bracero The 1949 film Border Incident looks at the issue Famed satirist Tom Lehrer wrote a song about Senator George Murphy in response to an infamous racist gaffe referring to Mexican labor which included the line after all, even in Egypt, the pharaohs, had to import Hebrew braceros. A Convenient Truth 2014 urges viewers not to let their governments repeat the follies of the braceros program, during the end credits. Exhibitions and collections On October 2009, the Smithsonian National Museum of American History opened a bilingual exhibition titled, Bittersweet Harvest, The Bracero Program, 1942–1964. Through photographs and audio excerpts from oral histories, this exhibition examined the experiences of Bracero workers and their families while providing insight into the history of Mexican Americans and historical context to today's debates on guest worker programs. The exhibition included a collection of photographs taken by photojournalist Leonard Nardel in 1956, as well as documents, objects, and an audio station featuring oral histories collected by the Bracero Oral History Project. The exhibition closed on January 3, 2010. The exhibition was converted to a traveling exhibition in February 2010 and traveled to Arizona, California, Idaho, Michigan, Nevada, and Texas under the auspices of Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service. See also Bracero selection process Maquiladera Topic Footnotes Topic Bibliography Barbara Driscoll de Alvarado, The Tracks North, The Railroad Bracero Program of World War II. Austin, Texas, CMAS Books, Center for Mexican American Studies, The University of Texas at Austin, 1999. Deborah Cohen, Braceros, Migrant Citizens and Transnational Subjects in the Postwar United States and Mexico Chapel Hill, N.C., University of North Carolina Press, 2011. Fred L. Coesler, Bracero Program, in Handbook of Texas Online. Texas State Historical Association, February 22, 2010.
Don Mitchell, they saved the crops, labor, landscape, and the struggle over industrial farming in Bracero era California. Athens, Georgia, University of Georgia Press, 2012. Anna Elizabeth Roses, Abrazando el Espiritu, Bracero Families Confront the U.S.-Mexico Border. Berkeley, California, University of California Press, 2014. OTM Scruggs, "'Texas and the Bracero Program, 1942–1947'", Pacific Historical Review 1963-32 No. 3 pp. 251–264 in JSTOR Michael Snodgrass, "'The Bracero Program, 1942–1964'", in Beyond the Border, The History of Mexican U.S. Migration, Mark Overmeyer Velasquez, ed., New York, Oxford University Press, 2011, pp. 79–102. Michael Snodgrass, "'Patronage and Progress, the Bracero Program from the Perspective of Mexico." In Workers Across the Americas, The Transnational Turn in Labor History, Leon Fink, ed., New York, Oxford University Press, 2011, pp. 245–266. Flores, Laurier 2016. Grounds for Dreaming, Mexican Americans, Mexican Immigrants, and the California Farmworker Movement. New Haven, Yale University Press. ISBN 0300196962. OCLC 906878123 Topic: External links The Bracero Project Los Braceros, Strong Arms to Aid the USA, Public Television Program Bracero History Archive Braceros in Oregon Photograph Collection Bittersweet Harvest, The Bracero Program 1942–1964 An online exhibition from the National Museum of American History, Smithsonian Institution